Hello, thanks for joining me today. I'm Ellen Spiegel. It's true. I know my video's title is a spoiler, but I did win the clam eating contest. You'll hear the whole story today. It's really a fun story. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ellen Spiegel. In addition to being a successful business owner and coach, I'm a recovering politician and an avid foodie. I love cooking. I love creating recipes. Once I even entered the Pillsbury Bake Off. I love eating. I love restaurants. I love watching YouTube videos about food. I just adore things food related, no matter what. It's one of my passions in life, which is probably why I'll never be thin, but that's neither here nor there. This is a story about a clam eating contest. What I learned, how some of the lessons from the clam eating contest have transformed my life, and how hopefully those same lessons can help transform yours. Let's dive in. The story takes place when I was 19 years old and returning to college for my sophomore year. I went to Cornell University, which is in the Finger Lake section of New York State. Ithaca was a pretty small town back then, and even today the population is just under 32,000 people. There were several colleges and universities in the area, and it's a vibrant food scene. I had heard a promotion on the radio about a new bar that was opening up. Back then, the drinking age in New York State was 18, and the bar was affiliated with a restaurant on the water that I loved, Kelly's Dockside Cafe. The new bar was to be in downtown Ithaca, not on the water, and they came up with a really cute and appropriate name, Kelly's Dry Dock. To kick things off and to call attention to their grand opening, they were hosting a clam eating contest. I called the radio station just on a lark thinking it would be fun to participate, and much to my surprise, I was able to land a spot in the contest. Now, I had a week or two before the contest to try to talk some friends into coming with me, and my friends mostly fell into one of two groups. So the first group said, you know, Ellen, you could win, and that would be really embarrassing for us. So no, we don't want to go. We don't want to be with you. We don't want to see this. The second group said, you know, Ellen, you're probably going to lose. And it would be really embarrassing. We don't want to see you fail. No, we don't want to see it. No, we're not going to go. But now my friend Tony, he is a great guy. And he said, you know what? I love you, Ellen. And I will be there for you no matter what. And yes, I'm happy to join you. So Tony and I go down. And as we're walking in for the start of the contest, we're met at the door by a DJ from the radio station who happened to be one of Tony's fraternity brothers and someone I had a crush on. And I was like, oh my goodness. And he looked at me and he started laughing. And he said, you know, and I saw your name on the list and I couldn't really believe it was you, that you'd really show up and that you'd be doing this. My initial thought was, well, what's up with that? But I said, I thought it would be really fun. And Tony said he'd come with me to help and cheer me on. And I just thought it would be a fun thing. So here I am. I then asked about the other contestants and were any of them there yet? And he pointed to two big guys. And I was really taken aback. I had never really thought about it. And I naively thought that the contest would be filled with students. It turns out that wasn't the case. Tony and I sat down to wait for the contest to begin. And while we were waiting, I was wait, watching people come in, trying to figure out the lay of the land and get an understanding of who my competitors were and how this was going to work. And as each person would come in, the cute guy at the door would point to the other contestants and then he'd point to me. And every time he'd point to me, the other contestants would start laughing. And I felt like they were saying, oh my gosh, how could she even do this? turns out I was the only woman in the competition. I was also the only student. And I was probably the only person who weighed under 250 or 300 pounds. So the other contestants were big, big men. I think they were truck drivers and farmers. And I was getting really angry. And I turned to Tony and I said, that's it. I have to win this. He looked at me and he said, how could you possibly win this? How is it possible that you're going to meet the, beat those nine burly men? I replied, I'm guessing I can outthink them. 
The thing is, if you think about the structure of the contest and the way the contest is going to work is that everybody had to eat 12 dozen clams and whoever finished the clams first would win. And it wasn't a time contest. It was just a matter of who gets there first and who wins the race. These were steam clams in the shell and we'd also have to take the clams out of the shell in order to eat them. I thought about it and I said to Tony, the trick to winning this contest isn't going to be the person who can eat the most. It isn't even going to be the person who can necessarily eat the fastest. It's going to be the person who can get the clams out of the shell and pop them into the mouth the fastest. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Ellen, I think you're right. I think it's an interesting approach. So the next thing I did was I ordered a dozen clams. As I placed the order, Tony looked at me like I was crazy and he said, what are you doing? Why are you ordering a dozen clams? You're going to be eating 12 dozen clams in a very short amount of time. And I said, you know what? I need to be practicing this. I need to figure this out. I need to understand what I'm doing and how to get the clams out of the shell. So I get my dozen clams and I'm playing around with the different um, scenarios to see how I can get the clams out of the shell because I determined that that was the key to my success. That was the most important part. That's what I had to focus on. And the more these other contestants would laugh at me, the more resolute I became. So now it comes time for the contest. And they lined us all up along a bar. There was a ledge, a very thin, narrow ledge right across against the wall. And we're lined up and there's these nine Himunga Jugundo guys and me. As we're set up, each person was given two stacks of six plates of clams. So we each had six dozen on this side, six dozen on this side. So we each had 12 plates of clams, 144 clams. So again, we're all lined up. There's the nine Himunga Jugundo guys and me. So it's big guy, big guy, big guy, big guy. Gosh, I can't even say it that fast. You get the point. Nine big guys, me at the end. So you get the point. Now a server comes around and she's being all cute and lighthearted and she says, um, so would you like some butter to go with your clams? And I looked at her and I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I would. And she asked how many little cups of butter I'd like. And I said, I'd like 10, please. And she looked at me and she said, 10? And I said, yes, 10, please. And everybody else, if they were asking for butter, it was one or maybe two little cups of butter. And she just looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, yes, 10 cups of butter, please. So she said, okay, she brings me the butter. So now I have my, on each side, I have a stack of plates and then outside of it, I have a little ring with five little cups of butter. And comes time for the contest. And I don't remember, they blew a whistle or they said, go, whatever it was, doesn't matter. So they get us sorted and as they kick it off, um, I take my, my nails, my hands, and I always like to have long nails, and back then too, and in fact they were probably even a little longer then, dunked all ten fingers into little cups of butter, then reached into the paper plates, scooped out ten clams at a time, popped them into my mouth, swallowed, moved the clams down, the two shells that were left, the two, uh, moved them down to the next plate, proceeded, worked my way through, Guess how long it took me to finish. Guess how long it took me to eat 144 clams. You ready? It took me 120 seconds, two minutes on the nose. It was shocking. The guy who was the closest competitor to me was just on his fourth dozen. Um, everybody was shocked. Everybody was amazed. Everybody was stunned. In fact, I think I might have broken a record because I researched it at the time and I couldn't come up with anybody who had eaten clams faster. I don't know if, if it was a record and, and if it is, I don't know if it's still there. I haven't researched it. I actually haven't thought about it in decades, but, but it was really, really fun and it was quite an accomplishment that I learned an awful lot from. Afterwards, my friends who weren't there asked me, how did you do it? I replied, I analyzed the problem. I assessed my strengths and weaknesses. I leaned into my strengths, came up with a strategy to deal with my strengths and with my weaknesses. And that's how I won. And that's what my structure for change can do for you. In my last video, I spoke about the seven ingredients of successful goal setting and the things that you need to do. 
One of the things I spoke about was taking a personal inventory, and that involves understanding your strengths and weaknesses. I put together a worksheet for you so that you can use to compile a personal inventory. It kind of looks like a brochure, and it includes place for a date and for your purpose. So you can see how your strengths and weaknesses change over time, and you can tailor the worksheet for various situations. The worksheet lets you list out things like your greatest strengths, things you're proud of, your core values, things that are important to you, things that you should bear in mind as you're tackling problems and challenges and setting goals. In a few minutes, I'll tell you how to get a copy of this for free. In the meantime, I wanna get back to talking about the underlying need for taking your personal inventory because strengths, weaknesses, and situations change over time and it's important to see how they interrelate. One thing that I find helpful in completing the exercise is using lists of values words. I found several on the internet. You can scan through the lists and see what words apply to you, either as a strength, a weakness, or something you admire, or something that you want to avoid and you don't want to be. I've put links to some of these lists in the comments section. In the example of the clam eating contest, some of the words that applied to me were resolute. I was determined to win and, and not to let people laugh at me. I was thoughtful. I thought I could outthink my competition. Achievement. I really, really wanted this achievement. Adaptability. I knew I could adapt and have different strategies based on who my opponents were. That's why I was looking around the room and I kept looking at them. But I also had weaknesses, size, um, ability to eat a lot, ability to succeed in the face of being ridiculed. You know how hard it is to succeed when everyone's laughing at you? Most people just want to like cover their face and go into the corner. And here I was saying like, hello world, I'm going to win this. It's a very, very different approach. But back to the exercise, go through the values, words, and ask yourself which of these words apply to you and the situation that you're considering and that you're analyzing. Sometimes the words reflect your strengths, sometimes weaknesses, and sometimes they're just not applicable to you, so you're not even going to use them. You're not going to put them in for this current situation. For each strength, think about how you can lean into that strength, how you can take it and build on it. If it's a weakness, think about how you can take that weakness and mitigate it. I always ask myself how I can help lessen the impact of my weaknesses. You'll never be able to get rid of all your weaknesses. That's just not doable and it's just not realistic. But you can minimize the impact of your weaknesses and amplify your strengths to the point that you can still move forward and you can still be successful. This is one of the best ways to achieve success. If you'd like a copy of the worksheet, I'm happy to email it to you. Please email me with your request. My email address is Ellen B. Spiegel, that's E-L-L-E-N, the letter B, Spiegel, S-P-I-E-G-E-L, at gmail.com. In my next video, we're going to be talking about creating your vision, understanding what's really important to you, and how you can use that knowledge so that you can achieve your goals. You can either start out with a grand vision that's sweeping for your whole life or a smaller vision that applies to just one particular situation or one particular thing that you want to do. Either way, it's the same process. I personally like to think small and work big, but if you'd rather start big and work downwards, that's okay too. It's basically coming up with something that will be a roadmap for yourself. If you have a roadmap, you need a roadmap. You need to have a roadmap so that you know where you are, you know where you're going, and you know how you're going to be stopping along the way. And it has to work for you. So with that, please leave some comments in the box. If you like it, please give a thumbs up and please share it and subscribe. Thanks for joining me. See you next time. Bye.